It's your boy, and he's sunburnt and illuminated as all hell, and tired as all hell because it's 10.30 at night. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop bringing you content, because it's your boy, Gabe. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So, we're going to do another one of those whole fun little things where we talk about decks that are good, and that's about it, because the only decks that matter are decks that are good. This time, though, we're going to be talking about premium, because while most of you guys like standard over premium, it wouldn't be a Nexus video if we weren't doing what we wanted, even if you guys don't want us to, because it's Nexus, so fuck our subs. Yeet! So, I don't know when this is going to be uploaded, hopefully before Tuesday, but on the day that we got the reveals for Mordred and Blaster Dark Dude Masquerade, we got a reveal of a BCF tournament in Sapporo, Japan, and we got the breakdown of the participation in that event. Japan, for whatever reason, they don't, apparently they just don't like revealing how many of each, like how many people entered, but I could be wrong. So if I, if, if somebody has the data for this event, please send it to me so we can fix this or whatever. We have the participation breakdown, so just how many of each clan uh, was entered in the tournament. And we also have the top eight as well as the winner of the event. So we're just going to go through that just so you can get an idea of what the meta looks like. This event is after the release of VBT05 in Japan. So we have Sukuyomi, we have Gansalot, even though we don't have the ruling where you're allowed to stride over grade twos. We have DAB! We have Nubatama, which is what a lot of people were excited for for this event. First off, as you can see in the pie charts, the three most well-represented clans of the event were Gold Paladin and Bermuda Triangle, both sharing 15%, and then Shadow Paladin at 13.2. After that, we have Kagero and Nubatama. Then we have OTT, Aquaforce, and Neo Nectar, all with their respective uh, participation numbers. And then the rest is unknown because there are others, so they were too small to put, be put on this list. Just to start off after that, we have the top eight, which in the top eight cut, we had one Dimension Police and one Pale Moon, which are the aberrations of the event as they clearly weren't in the like highest represented that I mentioned. But we also have Golds, which was represented, Bermudas, which was represented, Neo Nectar, which was represented, and OTT, which was represented all at one slot each. And Nubatama, fresh out of the VBT05 floodgates, we had two slots in top cuts, with the overall winner of the event going to Bermuda, which shouldn't be much of a surprise because Bermuda has been doing pretty well since its release in the last GEB because it's been doing so well that it didn't even, it could still top even when it didn't have V triggers. Uh, I know this is the first time we talked about premium in this metal light on the channel, but we're gonna just kind of look at it as what I guess a lot of people who have been looking at it would be expecting. So Gold's Bermuda, Shadows, OTT, and Neo Nectar should not be much of a surprise for us here in uh, the non, uh, OCG territories, America, whatever other countries um, you might be in, because our most recent set, with the exception of the Heroic Evolution, was the Premium Collection Booster, which was a huge meta-shifting booster for uh, the meta game. It's what gave Neo Nectar Katrina. It's what gave OTT the second Chichikima. It's what gave Shadows Morfessa. It's what gave Gold Spear X to make them even better. Because of that, we knew from OCG when they just got Premium Collection that these were good decks. But now that we're testing them here in our own countries firsthand, we know just how good that they are. So it shouldn't be much of a surprise that they have kept the quality that they have. Uh, if you haven't been paying attention to the premium and you're like thinking, oh, uh, I'm wanna, I don't know what to play, I want to get into the meta, it seems cool, 
I'll just give you a brief rundown of why these decks are good. So golds have been good pretty much in premium since their inception because new Bowman and old Criff plus Excel gifts and Wonder Ezel is spooky, but in the recent weeks, it's only gotten better. Whereas during the world tournament in the top cut of top eight for the world's events, three of eight decks were golds, but apparently that wasn't good enough. So on top of all of that, we got Spearax, so we could theoretically stride when their opponent is at grade one or grade two because of the Seabreeze Graveless Claws. There's also in the upcoming set Platinum Ezel, which can let you sculpt your drive checks and let you call as you're drive checking. So while it's a bit slow for the setup because you need to have multiple in Soul to get uh, multiple drive checks after that, you can still do it, which is kind of nutty. So yeah, gold isn't much of a um, shouldn't be much of a surprise to anybody, just because it's such a good deck. Everything in it works so well together; it's almost painful. Part of why it's on the watch list for the ban list is there, I feel like Bushi just doesn't know what to hit. You could hit Criff, but you can still just do what you, like Ezel players in Standard do and get a grade three while your opponent's still at grade one. You just will have one less drive check. You'll still have Bowman for the consistency piece. You'll still have Wonder as well just to get you a shit ton of gifts. It's a bunch of pieces that just work so, so well together. It just, in that way, it's reminiscent of Gear Chronicles Elite Four. Because of that, it's been doing very well. It's been doing well pretty much since Gold's got standard supports. It has only been getting better with each and every Gold boost, just because it's getting more and more pieces that make the deck even stronger. Bermuda, I'm not going to talk, talk about Bermudas that much, just because I wasn't around for the end of GEB for their release, so I don't really know a lot about the deck, at least to feel comfortable talking about it i just know it's really good the main thing i'm just going to say is that it was already it was pretty much the best freaking deck at the end of g no question and if if you didn't believe it then it should have been proved in the early ages of standard before they got their standard support because they were still topping premium events even though they didn't have v triggers or gifts or 13k bases it was already doing insanely well it really has only been doing better because now it has v triggers it can hit for it can it has triggers that apply for bigger numbers it has a pretty good early game like it has the grade two from Chocolat Melody where you just get a free call. So it already had a decent early game prior to this and it only got better after Standard because Standard's whole thing was giving people their early game back because no more uh, GBs. It shouldn't be much of a surprise that Bermuda's up there because it was already doing, it's pretty much been doing consistently well throughout premium. Like it was really never below like a tier two deck, I would say. Then on to Shadows. Shadows after the premium collection, they... It started off good. Like, people knew it was going to be good, but it's kind of been gaining traction as the waiting weeks of post-premium collection have come out because people are realizing just how much better it really is. It has a very strong early game. It has Maka for a draw every turn. It has Nemen for a free call every turn. If you're grade 2 gaming, you could honestly just go Blaster Dark and just Twin Drive. It has a lot of really good early game pieces, and Morfessa is an incredibly powerful boss monster. The deck is basically just turboing out G uh, Ritual 10, but that's also pretty easy to do because you have a lot of ways of retiring. You have a lot of ways of calling and then retiring with like Cursed Eye Raven and uh, Dagda and other cards that just let you retire. You can just call on top of them a la Legion era to fill up drop zone if you need to. And the fact that Morfessa also turns your grade zeros into uh, grade ones while in drop just makes the thing a whole lot more consistent. Lured was already good in the G era just because it has an incredible resource management game. Belial Owl is a when it's retired draw card and it shuffles itself into deck and it's a crit. Luard Original's stride skill is a plus one, and if the grade ones you call give you any pluses, it can just keep spiraling out of there. And Morfessa is still a draw two that fuels its own skill, and 15k and a crit and battle door skill is fucking terrifying, especially if you're running stand triggers and Dagda, so you can get four to six attacks every turn like that. It's such a powerful combo deck that can just do so much damage against your opponent it's just 
that's scary. Also, it has a great resource game because of the Luard. People are definitely picking it up for the power, but also the grind game, because if you don't kill them the first time you go into Morfessa, you'll probably survive and just kill them the second time, because that's how both tanky and powerful the deck is. So next, it, I'm going to be talking about uh, is uh, Nubatama. Nubatama was doing okay prior to this set. It had... The combo with the, I'm forgetting his name, it's the grade three that's like soul last threes, drop two perfect guards, bounce your opponent's hand, and make them discard five. It had synergy with that Rene, just because you could rip out your opponent's hand. It wasn't super consistent and or reliable, but it was able to do fairly well because of that. So the moment that Jamyo Kongo was revealed it, for VB205, pretty much everybody was excited for Premium Nubataba because on top of everything that Rene and all the other cards do, Jamyo Kongo just says your opponent has a hand size limit. And in Premium, where a lot of decks' hand size can be kind of absurd, putting the 4-6 to six limit on their hand is super painful, especially if you put that limit and then go into Rene because you just their hand is going to be 2 or 4, they're going to be attacked by Dominate with Crit, and then you start your new Batama uh, regular attack. So it's terrifying, and it's powerful, obviously, because that's why it's doing pretty well this fast. And on top of that, it provides a very strong check to a premium as a whole because it forces your opponent to have a hand cap, but some of the best decks in premium. Bermudas have a great hand, Shadows have a great hand, OTT all have great hands. So uh, the fact that Nubatama is able to provide a check to some of the best decks, making it, on top of a strong deck standalone, a strong anti-meta pick, is part of why Nubatama has already seen a pretty significant noticeable surge in play because of just how powerful the combo between Rene and Jamyo Kongo is. So that's there's a reason why everybody was excited for the deck after Jamyo got re revealed. And it's already proving that people's hype for the deck is very well met. Next is Kagero. So Kagero became as good as it was, not out of the premium collection, but out of the heroic evolution because of Blade Master. Blade Master gives you a vision token. Pre-standards of G-Era had stand triggers, which, while they can't stand vanguards, they can stand rear guards, which vision tokens are. And unlike things like uh, Alfred Holy Saver and Blaster Blade or um, Shibaraku Buster in Murakumo, where they have a limit to how many times they can drive check, Vision Tokens don't have that. So you just run a bunch of stand triggers and keep restanding your Vision Token and not only get multiple attacks, but a bunch of drive checks. So that's part of why it's able to be very strong. Well, sure, it's a 13k attack or what, 11, uh, 13k attack or 23 if you're on Force 1. It's definitely a noticeable guard, but it's not huge. The fact that you keep doing that guard while your opponent has to keep dropping and your hand is only increasing just because of three drive checks, basically it can spiral out of control. You just keep attacking with your vision token, then you attack with your vanguard once you stop getting vision, once you stop getting stand triggers and try to get more off your vanguard swing. But also you have Dauntless Drive Dragon, the break ride, which lets your vanguard re-stand. So if you didn't get stands on the first vanguard swing, you can maybe get stands on the second. And if you did get stands on the first Vanguard swing, you just keep your Vanguard standing until you whiff a stand on the Vision token and just keep going. Depending on how hard you're able to sack your stand triggers, it could just be insane. And even if you don't kill them, your hand is going to be so big and their hand is going to be so small that they're not killing you on your on their next turn. And even if your opponent damage denies you so you can't break right if, like, if you also don't have the Unlimiter, it's still a powerful combo because stand triggers equaling a 28 plus K attack and free three, two drive checks to go to your hand is just absurd. I think part of why it's not seeing more representation is, while it's not the best deck, other decks are faster and they can kill before you even get to your Blade Master turn, but also if you're playing against another control deck, like if you're doing a Blade Master Mirror, you can just deny Griffin their vision token and you're just 
They just don't do anything. A strong combo, but it can be countered by control G guards and just other decks that might be faster, but it's still a very, very powerful combo. Next after that is uh, Oracle Think Tank. Ichi Tom was good before the premium collection. It only got better after because new Ichi covered all of the bases that old Ichi couldn't. And it also makes the numbers huge even bigger when you factor in how it, in G zone it counts as you count your G zone as your hand. So it is painful guard restrict. Your opponent isn't allowed to perfect guard against an Ichi player, which is part of why people have been somewhat opting to not run perfect guards in the format because of how insane Ichi can be. There's all the generic good OTT support from standard like Rectangle Magus, Hexagonal, and uh, Imperial. There's their Sukuyomi in premium, where you just have the consistency of the Sukuyomi ride changes to get free cards because you can just get checking the top deck. We, it's pretty obvious. Guard restricting is a very powerful mechanic, especially when it's by grade instead of something like Battle Lord, which, well, that's obviously good too. Restricting your opponent from being able to perfect guard or G guard is fucking absurd. Even if you go under new Ichi, they basically can't G guard because the auto ability is nullified. So unless they have a G guard with a continuous skill like Plot Maker, it's only going to be a 15 or so shield, which is just the same drop as a regular 20k heal trigger in standard. So it's basically like you're shutting down both of them, which is just so powerful. And if you add Tom on top of that, where they can't guard with normal units, even if it's a bit slower, old Ichi and new Tom is a literally unguardable attack. You can only intercept or guard from like the bind zone or whatever. But again, it really hurts the Jamyo Kongo because even if like, because that's also a protect deck, so they can kind of defend pretty decently, but also cutting your hand means your ability to guard is severely cut because that's kind of OTT's bread and butter, but also your ability to get numbers from new Ichi is also severely limited as well. Uh, next, going to be talking about Aqua Force. I'm not going to really talk about this either because like Bermuda's, I don't really... I've been busy, so I haven't really been able to pay attention a lot to the Japanese meta, but also... I haven't been, especially been paying attention to My Glorious Justice because I don't care about any of the clans in that. My guess is just Aqua Force has a really good early game because it's Aqua Force. It only got better with the new standard support because there's the one card that lets you search Algo, so it makes the early game even more consistent. Also, Valios is a strong card because it lets you draw quite a bit, especially later in the game. It's a lot of cards that can work well together, and because the nature of premium is basically striding the nature is inadvertently early game because if you if you can only do things in the late game you're going to be kind of dead in the water so aqua force inherently being an early game clan is part of what helped it probably stay afloat pun intended but yeah again don't want to go too on just because uh full disclosure i haven't been paying attention i'm gonna try to pay more attention i'm gonna try to get as often as these big events happen, I'm going to try to provide some coverage on them just so we can talk about the meta and see what happened. I've done two tier lists by myself. One was after Tachikazi, Spike Brothers, and Mega Colony, the, the set where nobody cares about the clans in it. And then VBTO4 because I didn't do anything in between or after that, so I'm just gonna try to make these more consistent. Lastly, gonna talk about Neonectar. Like I just said, early game is very important in premium, and Neonectar has tokens, which is literally free advantage. Being able to get a near or full board by your grade two ride turn is an incredibly advantageous thing to be able to do even in when decks like OTT run the 12k shieldless vanillas. There, on top of that though, there is Ermin Soul, which gives makes your column 25k with a plus one if you put it in front of a token. You have cards like Kaivant, which can go from plus five to plus 20. So while you're not going plus like with Ermin Soul, you can just bait the shit out of your opponent with a giant number. So you have an incredibly strong early game. And even if your opponent attacks your rear guards, you got Sylvia and Merka and Fruit Basket Elf just to get them back for free. So you can definitely, provided you don't brick, you can definitely um, have an incredibly strong early game. But on top of that, Katrina is an insane card. Being able to get two attacks off of one force token is 
really good, which is why we barely have any multi-attacks on Force and Standard. But Katrina lets you get two off of one, but three if you have Gladiola. So being able to abuse that free 10k is incredibly strong, but because you're able to get six or seven attacks a turn, you're being able to get five to seven attacks a turn, no problem, is really good, especially in a Force clan, and especially a Force clan that has as good of an early game as Neonector does. So, yeah, it's... It was. It started doing really well the moment that premium collection dropped. So it shouldn't be surprised to anybody that has been paying attention that it's still able to hang on even after um, multiple months after the um, the heroic evolution, my glorious justice, and aerial liberation. So I'm not really going to talk about di d police. I'm sorry, and pale moon. Because while they did make it to top cut, they're obviously the outliers in this. Because Vanguard has a lot of variants even in premium. Pale Moon has the pseudo loop with Alice and Ginny. It has the literal loop with Songster. So that's part of why it was able to do, at least perform somewhat well before the premium collection. But yeah, they're not doing amazing. So... I just don't really feel the need to talk about them right now because they're pretty clearly the outliers in this. Uh, that, that about wraps it up. Remember, this wasn't designed to be a tier list. I'm just discussing what the top eight was and how we can reflect the meta. You can use this to get an idea of what the tier list can look like. Like, you could probably, if, if we're looking at this event, you can get the idea that Gold, Shadows, and Bermudas are probably the tier one uh, Nubatama, I would say, is tier 2 because it still only had 7-8% uh, of representation while the others had uh, double digits. But I would say it's still, be based off of this event alone, is the best tier 2 deck. And then the rest that were named, so OTT, Kagero, Aqua Force, Neonectar were all tier uh, 2 with it, just a little bit behind noobs. But also, just remember, this is one event. This isn't uh, collective information from multiple. My tier lists, while they I try to get it from a bunch of sources, they're still local, so they're smaller tournaments. So that's why I say you can get a good idea of what the medic will look like when we get closer and closer to Aerial Liberation, because many of the decks that were meta are still meta in Japan's metagame from this event. So it, this just gives you an idea of where your clan might stand or where a clan you might want to pull uh, play after the set might stand. Like, comment, subscribe as always. If you have any recommendation or notes to give me just to provide better coverage on these larger events, including more resources than just the Bushi Weekly Stream, please let me know. I'm trying to make these as good as I can just to give the uh, areas a good idea of what the metal looks like. So like, comment, subscribe, and see you guys next time.